The Reverend John Stott has a massive reputation among evangelical Christians. He is widely regarded as one of the greatest church leaders of our time. In 2005, Time magazine ranked him among the 100 most influential people in the world. Christianity Today described Stott as an architect of 20th century evangelicalism who shaped the faith of a generation. Evangelist Billy Graham wrote of his friend John Stott, I can't think of anyone who has been more effective in introducing so many people to a biblical worldview. Christian biographer John Pollock called him the theological leader of world evangelicalism. John Stott has even been lauded as the evangelical pope. His longtime friend Billy Graham once said of him, John Stott is the most respected clergyman in the world. But how did a man who lived his whole life within eight blocks of all souls, the famous central London church he served for over 60 years, become the acknowledged worldwide leader of evangelicals for decades? His books, especially The Cross of Christ and Basic Christianity, have been standard works and bestsellers among evangelical Christians. Basic Christianity originated as a series of talks at an evangelistic outreach that Stott gave at the University of Cambridge in England in 1952. Over the years, uh, what actually has happened is that the book has become a basic uh, book for those who do believe, just to in inform them of what their faith is all about. I think Stott has defined IVP perhaps more than any other author, first of all, just in sheer volume. He's uh, published over 50 titles with us in the last five decades, which have sold a combined uh, six million copies in North America alone. Secondly, I think Stott always emphasizes the core of what Christianity is all about. He's yeah, Anglo-American axis that uh, we would uh, identify uh, with uh, John Stott and Jim Packer also has had a tremendous impact on the American church. University Press was the bridge that brought those voices to America. One of John Stott's greatest achievements was the founding in 1974, together with his friend Billy Graham, of the Lausanne Movement for the Evangelization of the World. Although Stott has been widely recognized as a great Christian leader, theologian, writer on Christian apologetics, as well as a very gifted preacher, Few Christians know anything about his political ideology. Yet there is no doubt that John Stott's political convictions have significantly affected his evangelical beliefs and helped shape the Lausanne movement. So to understand the real John Stott, we must examine both his theology and his political ideology. First we consider his theology. Despite his large reputation, a close examination will reveal serious flaws in John Stott's theological understanding. John Stott was a lifelong convinced theistic evolutionist. Throughout most of his life as a theologian, he believed and taught an evolutionary version of creation from the first chapters of Genesis. In an article in the Church of England newspaper, he wrote, It seems perfectly possible to reconcile the historicity of Adam with at least some theistic evolutionary theory. He argued that it was quite possible, quote, that when God made man in his own image, what he did was to stamp his own likeness on one of the many hominoids which appeared to have been living at the time. In 1986, a high school science teacher 
having heard John Stott's presentation on his recently published book, The Cross of Christ, in public, asked John Stott how he reconciled his belief in theistic evolution with his strongly stated conviction that Adam was a real historical figure. John Stott answered with his now famous Homer Divinus analogy, claiming that the dust of the earth from which Adam was made was the evolutionary process guided by God, whereby man evolved from ape-like ancestors. It was his contention that Adam was basically the first evolved ape, or rather first evolved from the ape-like common ancestor. Into this ape-like Adam, God breathed his soul. In Understanding the Bible, Stott attempts to justify his evolutionary views. He wrote, But my acceptance of Adam and Eve as historical is not incompatible with my belief that several forms of pre-Adamic hominid may have existed for thousands of years previously. These hominids began to advance culturally. They made their cave drawings and buried their dead. It is conceivable that God created Adam out of one of them. You may call them Homo erectus. I think you may even call some of them Homo sapiens, for these are arbitrary scientific names. But Adam was the first Homo divinus, if I may coin a phrase, the first man to whom may be given the biblical designation made in the image of God. So in direct contradiction of scripture, John Stott says that as hominids began to advance culturally, it is conceivable that God created Adam out of one of them. Scripture says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. This tells us a lot about John Stott's view of scripture, for he is prepared to disregard the clear teaching of scripture when it does not support his world view. His teaching on evolution has had a powerful effect on the thinking of many Christians, especially young people, who now accept theistic evolution as an article of faith. Undoubtedly, John Stott's theistic evolution made him intellectually respectable in the eyes of the world. John Stott's famous book, Issues Facing Christians Today, has a chapter on homosexual partnerships. Because of the explosive nature of the topic, he begins by laying out the context for his discussion. He writes, Not only are we all sexual beings, but we all have a particular sexual orientation. The American zoologist Alfred Kinsey's famous investigation into human sexuality led him to place every human being somewhere on a spectrum from zero, an exclusively heterosexual bias attracted only to the opposite sex, to six, an exclusively homosexual bias attracted only to the same sex. In between these poles, Dr. Kinsey plotted varying degrees of bisexuality referring to people whose sexual orientation is either dual or intermediate or fluctuating. John Stott reaches this conclusion. The great majority of homosexual people are not responsible for their condition. Since they are not deliberate perverts, they deserve our understanding and compassion, not our rejection. John Stott's preferred option for the homosexual condition is a Christian environment of love, understanding, acceptance, and support. John Stott shows a complete lack of discernment by quoting the so-called research of Alfred Kinsey, for it was widely known that Kinsey was not only a fraud, but an amoral sexual pervert who was promoting an anti-Christian amoral sexual ideology which opened the floodgates of the sexual revolution 
in Western society, Dr. Judith Reisman's book, Kinsey, Sex and Fraud, carefully documents the fraudulent nature and depravity of Kinsey's research. We would have hoped that as a theologian and Bible teacher, the Reverend Stott would have been aware of Kinsey's amoral agenda. Scripture says God created man in his own image, male and female he created them. Yet in blatant defiance of the most basic teaching of Scripture, Stott has chosen to promote Kinsey's theory of a sexual spectrum rather than God's creation ordinance of mankind created male and female. Despite his reputation as a Bible scholar, John Stott was perfectly comfortable working alongside the theologians of Fuller Theological Seminary, although they held a deeply compromised view on the inerrancy of Scripture. Daniel Fuller, when he was Dean of the Seminary, promoted the idea that there are two kinds of Scripture, revelational Scripture that is wholly without error, and non-revelational scripture that is not without error. By the end of the 1960s, a limited inerrancy was the dominant view of the seminary, yet John Stott was willing to work closely with theologians from Fuller Seminary in driving forward the agenda of the Lausanne movement. Significantly, the Lausanne movement has produced the booklet Making Disciples of Oral Learners, which promotes the concept of a so-called oral Bible, which is composed of a number of crafted Bible stories. Cape Town Commitment, which followed the Congress of 2010, written by Dr. Christopher Wright of All Souls Langham Place, London, said, the Lausanne movement was committed to making available an oral format story Bible as a matter of priority. Clearly this commitment to an oral Bible could only have been made with the full knowledge and consent of John Stott. To promote the concept of storytelling across the world, in 2005, the Lausanne movement helped to establish the International Orality Network. As a consequence, the orality movement is sweeping through the evangelical world at an alarming rate. The effect of the orality movement and its oral Bible is to downgrade scripture in the eyes of a large section of the world's population. The divine wisdom of scripture is being replaced with the trivial messages of the storyteller. Lusanne's campaign to promote the oral Bible comes from its flawed view of scripture. The age-long war against the Bible appears to have found a willing ally in the Lausanne movement. In Evangelical Essentials, published in 1988, John Stott appeared to question the doctrine of eternal punishment in hell. He wrote, I also believe that the ultimate annihilation of the wicked should at least be accepted as a legitimate, biblically founded alternative to their eternal conscious torment. He said, Emotionally, I find the concept intolerable and do not understand how people can live with it without either cauterizing their feelings or cracking under the strain. But our emotions are a fluctuating, unreliable guide to truth and must not be exalted to the place of supreme authority. But John Stott's position with regard to eternal punishment remained ambiguous. Although he said he believed in eternal punishment, at the same time he tentatively held an annihilationist view. And so we have the remarkable situation of a great theologian who did not feel able to make a clear declaration on what he really believed about eternal punishment.
John Stott was always sympathetic to the cause of women's ordination in the Church of England. He believed that it is biblically permissible for women to teach men, provided that the content of their teaching is biblical, its context a team, and its style humble. His position is based on the idea that God gives gifts to both men and women, therefore women should be encouraged to use their gifts. He writes, quote, If God endows women with spiritual gifts, which he does, and thereby calls them to exercise their gifts for the common good, which he does, then the church must recognize God's gifts and calling, must make appropriate spheres of service available to women, and should ordain, that is, commission and authorize, them to exercise their God-given ministry, at least in team situations, end of quote. There is no doubt that Stott's endorsement of ordination of women as deacons and presbyters, as long as they were not in positions of headship, swayed many within the Church of England to accept this development. In fact, it was evangelicals who swayed the vote in 1992, and that is why there are now nearly 3,000 women clergy in the Church of England. John Stott's illogical corresponding position that they should not be in pastoral oversight has of course been ignored. In line with John Stott's position, Lucerne III in Cape Town promoted female leadership in the church. The message to emerge from the Congress was that women should have an equal role in preaching and leading the Church of Jesus Christ. Ecumenism has always been at the heart of John Stott's ministry. He frequently affirmed his belief in the visible unity of the church, and he wanted denominations to make the ecumenical stance more credible. He saw a particular ecumenical significance in the charismatic movement. Throughout his long career, he hankered after reunion with the Church of Rome. He was also an advisor to the World Council of Churches and at the forefront of the Evangelical Catholic movement in Great Britain. A defining moment of John Stott's career came in October 1966 when he was chairing a meeting of the National Assembly of Evangelicals. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, widely regarded as the leading evangelical preacher of his day, had been invited to give the keynote address at the opening session of the Assembly. In his address, later entitled Evangelical Unity and Appeal, Lloyd-Jones contended that evangelicals had not done enough to protest the unscriptural tendencies in the ecumenical movement. He asked, how can you evangelize truly unless you are agreed about the evangel? He suggested that failure to be clear about the doctrine of the church is one of the greatest hindrances to true evangelism. As a strong believer in evangelical unity, he said the answer was for evangelicals to leave the compromised denominations and form their own grouping. Faithful ministers of the present day, he said, are the representatives and the successors of the glorious men who fought the same fight, the good fight of faith in centuries past. We are standing in the position of the Protestant reformers. When Dr. Lloyd-Jones finished speaking, John Stott took the podium and in an impromptu speech, to the surprise of all present, virtually rebuked the doctor. His actual words were, I believe history is against what Dr. Lloyd-Jones has said. Scripture is against him. I hope no one will act precipitously. According to the Reverend Robert Horn, the atmosphere was electric. None of us had seen an, an occasion like it. The two leading evangelicals of the day, differing in public, 
over a matter of such practical importance. What Dr. Lloyd-Jones did not appreciate was how deeply the ecumenical vision had penetrated the soul of John Stott and other evangelical Anglicans. Within six short months, John Stott would become the chairman and driving force of the first National Evangelical Anglican Congress, which convened at Kiel in April 1967. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Michael Ramsey, a liberal Anglo-Catholic, was invited to give the opening address. To the obvious delight of the Archbishop, who had officially visited the Pope in the Vatican in 1966, the Congress expressed a positive attitude to ecumenism. This new enthusiasm for ecumenism on the part of Evangelical Anglicans was the main outcome of the Congress. John Stott warned the Assembly, Evangelicals in the Church of England are changing. We have acquired a reputation for narrow partisanship and obstructionism. We need to repent and change. In obedience to Stott's appeal, Evangelical Anglicans appear to have changed their view of the Reformation by the time of the Second Congress in Nottingham in 1977. Again under the leadership of John Stott, the Congress confidently asserted that the Church on Earth is marked out by baptism, which is complete sacramental initiation into Christ and His body. In response to the Second Vatican Council, the Congress affirmed, Seen ourselves and Roman Catholics as fellow Christians, we repent of attitudes that have seemed to deny it. He told the Congress that the visible unity of all professing Christians should be our goal, and evangelicals should join others in the Church of England in working towards full communion with the Roman Catholic Church. To defend his position, he wrote, while still regarding the major issues of the Reformation as crucial, we welcome the progress made towards doctrinal agreement, such as evidenced in the Anglo-Roman Catholic International Commission. Yet John Stott was going so far as to define the Church as the community of those baptised a view of the Church that is wholly consistent with the post-Vatican II teachings of Rome. It was now clear that Stott's view of the Church and Lloyd-Jones' view, a body of believers justified by faith in Christ alone, were fundamentally different, and this was the actual reason for the division in October 1966. While Lloyd-Jones still clearly believed in the doctrines of the Reformation, John Stott's position was ambiguous, for although he paid lip service to the Reformation, his actions told a different story, for at heart he was an ecumenist who was working to achieve full communion with the Church of Rome. When Pope John Paul II visited England in 1982 and was invited to participate in an ecumenical service in Canterbury Cathedral, John Stott said, quote, It seemed entirely right that the United Service should include a recitation of the Apostles' Creed and so a reaffirmation of our common baptismal faith. John Stott taught that evangelism and social action are a partnership like two blades of a pair of scissors or two wings of a bird. In the Lausanne Covenant of 1975, he wrote, It is our duty to be involved in socio-political action, that is, both in social action, caring for society's casualties, and in political action, that is, concern for the structures of society itself. The first Lausanne Congress adopted the term evangelization, which called for a renewed mission to the world with a more holistic approach to evangelism, which encouraged Christians to commit themselves to the cause of social justice with a special interest in the needs of the poor and oppressed. The Congress affirmed that evangelism 
and sociopolitical involvement are both part of our Christian duty. The Great Commission of Christ is to make disciples of all nations and says nothing about socio-political action. The risen Christ instructed his disciples just before his ascension into heaven that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. John Stott has distorted the Great Commission by adding to Christ's words a social dimension, but the Great Commission is about preaching repentance and remission of sins, for Christ came into the world to save sinners, not to lead a socio-political revolution. Of course Christians are to do good works, but that is the fruit of the Christian life, not part of Christ's Great Commission. An event that tells us much about Stott's theology occurred in October 2007 when a large number of prominent Muslim clerics, scholars and intellectuals signed a letter calling for peace between Muslims and Christians. The Muslim letter, entitled A Common Word Between Us and You, says to Christians that Muslims are not against them and that Islam is not against them and urges followers of the two faiths to find common ground between Christianity and Islam. A Christian letter of response, entitled Loving God and Neighbor Together, drafted by scholars at Yale Divinity School, was featured in the New York Times in November 2007. Another really chilling development that we should keep our eye on that is heartbreaking as as much of this is that you have emerging church leaders and secret sensitive leaders and uh purpose-driven leader you know guys like claren and robert schuller and bill hybels and uh, of course uh, rick warren signing a document called loving god and neighbor together you and both of these documents the muslims wrote first and then you have the professing christian response is about unification and that we can only be one if we agree that we're worshiping the same God. And both documents affirm that document that Rick Warren and Brian McLaren signed uh, affirms that, that the God of Islam is the God of Christianity. Both documents call Muhammad a prophet. Chillingly, the preamble to the so-called Christian agreement to the Muslim document signed by emergent, seeker-sensitive and purpose-driven leaders states this, quote, before we shake your hand in responding to your letter, we ask forgiveness of the All-Merciful One and of the Muslim community around the world, end quote. The so-called All-Merciful One is none other than Allah. This is a prayer to the sunless Allah, who is called the All-Merciful One throughout the Quran, and not to the true God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian letter of response was signed by John Stott and about 300 other Christian leaders. It affirmed that what is common between Christians and Muslims lies in something that is absolutely central to both, love of God and love of neighbor. In the Muslim tradition, God, the Lord of the worlds, is the infinitely good and all-merciful. And the New Testament states clearly that God is love. Since Muslims seek to love their Christian neighbors, they are not against them. As Christians, we resonate deeply with this sentiment. The Christian letter concluded, the future of the world depends on our ability as Christians and Muslims to live together in peace. If we fail to make every effort to make peace and come together in harmony, you correctly remind us that our eternal souls are at stake. It is with humility and hope that we receive your generous letter and we commit ourselves to labor together in heart, soul, mind and strength for the objectives you so appropriately purpose. The Christian response, which asked forgiveness of the All-Merciful One and of the Muslim community around the world, 
was a deeply heretical document, for it suggested that Islam and Christianity worship the same God, and it said nothing about the exclusiveness of the Christian faith. It did not declare to the Muslim world that it needs the gospel of Christ, that there is salvation in Christ alone, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Signatures to the Christian letter included the Reverend John Stott of All Souls Church, London, Dr. Christopher Wright, International Director of Langham Partnership, London, and Rick Warren, Senior Pastor, Saddleback Church, California. The fact that John Stott signed the Christian letter tells us much about his theology, for he publicly acknowledged Muhammad as a prophet and asked forgiveness of the All-Merciful One. His assertion that the Lausanne movement is for the evangelization of the world has a hollow ring, for he has signed a document that seeks peace with Islam, yet says nothing about preaching the gospel of Christ to the Muslim world. We now turn to John Stott's political agenda. In his exposition of the Lausanne Covenant, John Stott called upon political leaders to guarantee the freedoms that have been set forth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was unanimously adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations in December 1948. His hope, quote, is that in the future, evangelical leaders will ensure that their social agenda includes such vital but controversial topics as halting climate change, eradicating poverty, abolishing armories of mass destruction, responding adequately to the AIDS pandemic, and asserting the human rights of women and children in all cultures. In his book, Issues Facing Christians Today, John Stott deals with the issue of what he calls North-South Inequality. He says that although the United Nations endorsed the call by Third World countries for a new international economic order in 1974, little progress has been made to implement these proposals. John Stott says that, quote, we need to pray that God will call more of his people to develop new international economic policies, work for political solutions, and give their lives in the field of third world development. We should ensure that our daily newspaper has adequate third world coverage and perhaps subscribe to a magazine devoted to third world needs and join the world development movement. John Stott considers the role of the church with regard to work and unemployment. He says that many Christians need to change their attitude towards the unemployed and persuade the public to do the same. Those who have been schooled in the values of the so-called Protestant work ethic, that is industry, honesty, resourcefulness, thrift, and so on, tend to despise those who are losers in the struggle to survive as if it were their fault. John Stott, it seems, had little time for the Protestant work ethic. Christianity Today published the article Creative by Creation, Our Need for Work, in which John Stott says that although successive British governments have done much to create jobs, quote, Christians ought not to hesitate to lobby parliamentarians, local authorities, industrialists, employers, union officials and others to create more employment opportunities. Theologian John Robbins of the Trinity Foundation, commenting on Stott's essay, refers to him as a British socialist.
a theologian who had a significant impact on the thinking and political views of John Stott was Professor Ronald Sider, the founder of Evangelicals for Social Action, a think tank which aims to develop solutions to social and economic problems. Sider's political views are expressed in Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, published in 1977 which Christianity Today describes as one of the most important books of the 20th century. In the chapter, God and the Poor, Sider raises the impertinent question in bold capitals, Is God a Marxist? And then discusses in some detail how the God of the Bible wreaks horrendous havoc on the rich. The reader is left with the outrageous suggestion that perhaps God is a Marxist, or at least sympathetic to Marxist ideology. According to Wikipedia, Ronald Sider is often identified by others with the Christian left. Professor Sider's political views, expressed in rich Christians, struck a chord with John Stott, and this allowed the two men to form a close working arrangement. The basic premise of rich Christians is that third world poverty is caused by the selfishness and exploitation of Christians in the rich West. Sider asserts that Christians in the affluent West have become entangled in a complex web of institutional sin. Quote, if God's word is true, then all of us who dwell in affluent nations are trapped in sin. We have profited from systematic injustice. We are guilty of an outrageous offence against God and neighbour, end of quote, inside a simplistic view. All Christians in the West are trapped in sin, for the economic system that has made them affluent, that is capitalism, is a system that produces systematic injustice. He calls on Christians in the West to repent, quote, the one who stands ready to forgive us of our sinful involvement in terrible economic injustice offers us his grace to begin living a radical new lifestyle of identification with the poor and oppressed. It is abundantly clear that Sider is promoting a radical socialist agenda dressed up in Christian garb. His thesis that third world poverty is caused by rich Christians in the West, is ridiculous. Sider entirely ignores the blessings that come from a biblical work ethic. <music> Professor Sider's ability to use scripture in a way that provided support for his socialist views had a great appeal for John Stott. And so it was no surprise that in 1980, a working group was set up under the Lausanne banner, coordinated by Ronald Sider and under the chairmanship of John Stott, to study simple living in relation to evangelism, relief and justice. The Lausanne paper entitled An Evangelical Commitment to Simple Lifestyle, drafted by John Stott and greatly influenced by Ronald Sider, was simply a regurgitation of the socialist message of rich Christians. Christians in the West are held to be responsible for world poverty and therefore guilty of institutional sin. Their Christian duty is not only to redistribute resources to those living in poverty, but also to fight for a new international economic order. Because of the dominion or responsible stewardship which God has given us, Christians should be in the vanguard of those who are seeking to arrest climate change and seeking also to protect habitats. In Issues Facing Christians Today, John Stott identified our human environment as a key issue. He exhorted Christians to learn to think and act ecologically. As we prepare for Lausanne 3, 
to be held in Cape Town in October 2010, on the one hand, we are facing new challenges. For example, there is the specter of global warming, which adds new urgency to our evangelism. So it was no surprise that the environment featured prominently on the Congress agenda. In his book, The Radical Disciple, Stott again focuses on the green agenda, asserting that Christians must address the ecological crisis facing mankind. Climate change deserves special attention in Stott's call to discipleship. Of all the global threats that face our planet, this is the most serious, he wrote. One cannot help but see that our whole planet is in jeopardy. Crisis is not too dramatic a word to use. It is surprising that John Stott has taken such a strong stand in support of the Green Agenda. While Christians are to be good stewards of God's creation, we should not allow a politically driven agenda to dominate our view of the environment, as John Stott has done. John Stott was deeply antagonistic towards traditional evangelicals, whom he disparagingly labelled fundamentalists, reserving for himself the term evangelical. In Evangelical Essentials, a liberal evangelical dialogue published in 1988, he provides a list of eight tendencies of the mindset style fundamentalism from which he wishes to dissociate himself. First on John Stott's list is the assertion that fundamentalists have a general suspicion of scholarship and science, which sometimes degenerates into thoroughgoing anti-intellectualism. Yeah, Stott is attempting to defend his theistic evolutionary beliefs against those Christians who accept God's act of creation in six days. John Stott declares that fundamentalists adopt a separatist ecclesiology together with a blanket repudiation of the ecumenical movement and the World Council of Churches. As a committed ecumenist, he dissociates himself from reformed Christians who reject the ecumenical movement and the liberalism of the World Council of Churches. Yeah, we should remember the Nottingham Conference of 1977 chaired by John Stott, which asserted, seeing ourselves in Roman Catholics as fellow Christians, we repent of attitudes that have seemed to deny it. It seems more than strange that the Reverend Stott, who accepts Roman Catholics as fellow Christians, is not able to accept reformed Bible-believing Christians who actually believe the fundamentals of the faith and promote the doctrines of the Reformation. He goes even further, accusing fundamentalists of some extreme right-wing political concerns. Yeah, we have a dyed-in-the-wool socialist who openly supports a radical left-wing political agenda, accuse his theological opponents of right-wing politics. Surely there is more than an element of hypocrisy in this accusation, but not in John Stott's mind for those who do not support his socialist agenda are branded as having extreme right-wing concerns. Towards the end of his long career, John Stott formed a close relationship with Rick Warren, famous pastor of Saddleback Church, California, and author of The Purpose Driven Life. In October 2005, John Stott eagerly endorsed Rick Warren's famous peace plan when he was invited to preach at Saddleback Church. John Stott stepped into the pulpit wearing a blue Hawaiian t-shirt in the vein of Pastor Rick Warren. The hope was that Warren's peace plan, plant churches, equip servant leaders, assist the poor, care for the sick, educate the next generation would be the beginning of a new reformation. 
Such was the affinity between the two men that Rick Warren wrote a foreword for the 50th anniversary edition of John Stott's bestseller, Basic Christianity, published in 2008. In 2010, Rick Warren gave his wholehearted endorsement to the Third Lausanne Congress, making it clear that he was a great supporter of John Stott's vision of Christianity that included a strong commitment to socio-political action. Undoubtedly, the two men shared a common view of the Christian faith. Warren explained his devotion to Stott. He said, I believe he is among the three most influential Christians in the last half of the 20th century, right alongside Billy Graham and Mother Teresa. There is no doubt that Uncle John has had a tremendous influence on my own life and ministry. He was one of my closest mentors, and recently I flew to the UK just to pray for him and sit by his bed. Two factors dominated John Stott's ministry. First was an ecumenical agenda that repented of the Reformation and wanted reunion with the Church of Rome. Second was a socialist agenda that sought after a new economic world order in order to redistribute wealth to the world's poor, the promotion of social justice and human rights, and a deep concern for the environment and climate change. The creation of the Lausanne movement was a means to achieve these ends. The real John Stott was a committed socialist who has probably done more to undermine the Reformation and true biblical Christianity than any other man in the last century.